cross my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trouble, death, where is your sting? seated as we go through a few announcements. Uh, just so everyone knows, I mean, I know that it's a, it's a little warm in here. Uh, we do have some waters in the back available if you need them. We're not able to have just the, the open uh, uh, water dispenser, what do you call it, the sparklets bottle. We're not able to have that going right now uh, with COVID regulations, but we do have some bottled water in the back if someone needs it. Just let one of the workers in the back know and we'll get it for you. Uh, we do have fellowship groups still going on throughout the week. We have some groups meeting in person, some groups meeting online. Email us to get more information about a group. We think it's of great importance that everyone's involved in a fellowship group. 
especially now when it's hard for us to really be together with any frequency. Uh, so whether, you know, whether it's, we've got Tuesday groups, Sunday groups, Wednesday, Thursday, got those all out of order, but I think those are all the right days. Uh, but we have had groups, what's that? Sunday. Sunday, I think I said Sunday. Yeah. I got <laughs> Not in the right order, but I think I said it. Uh, so, but we have groups all throughout the week. Uh, we have a group that's right for you. Please get in touch with us. Get in touch with a fellowship group leader. If you already know someone, please be in a fellowship group. If you're affected by COVID-19 or just the general circumstances of the quarantine and everything that it's causing, please let us know. We have a needs form that we've sent out and I think every email that you can fill out. If you don't have access to the form, that's okay. Just tell us. Uh, the, the form's a great way for us to collect that information. If you don't have a link to it, just, just email us. Tell us. It's fine. We, we want to be able to be there for you. We want to be able to support you, uh, whatever those needs may be. And if you have a prayer request, whether it's related to COVID-19 or just anything, please also be sure to also update us on how God is meeting those needs uh, so that we can rejoice with you and praise God with you and also just so that we can keep our prayer request list up to date. If you want to follow along with us today, we'll be reading from the ESV Bible. You can find one under your seat, or you can download it for free on your phone at ES, through just ESV, the app. Uh, you can also go to ESV.org and access it for free there. The other location you can find it is our FBC app. You can download our church's app through the app store at Tithely, T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. Uh, and then when you're in there, you'll just search for Fellowship Baptist Church. And within the app, you'll have access to the ESV Bible, past sermons, the live feed, news and updates, and prayer requests. Uh, so please be sure to download that. Uh, also, within the app, you'll have access to Tithe if you choose to do so through that. There will be, um, no, there's not a new members meeting class today, but we will have some new members uh, interviews today. So if you're one of those, be sure to uh, stick around and we're excited to get to know you a little better. Uh, at the end of the service, we're going to have everyone please exit through this door. Uh, we're not going to have you exit the way you came in. Everyone's going to exit out this way into the courtyard. And if you want to hang out and, you know, get to get a chance to be together, that's great. We just, we're going to push it outside as fast as we can. So we're going to have absolute minimal uh, socializing in the building. We're going to have people just move out into the courtyard. Should be pretty well shaded. Um, and you can just throw any trash out in this trash can right here. And that's everything. Please stand with me for our call to worship. We'll be reading from Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. And it reads, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Making purification for, excuse me, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you that we can come before you today, Lord. We thank you that we can come together and worship your holy name. I pray, God, that you would be glorified from the singing of your praise that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word. And I pray that you would use this time to make us more like Christ when we leave than when we came. I pray, God, that you would, through your word and through the grace and the power of your spirit, cause us to grow in our understanding of what it means to be purified in Christ. What an incredible work you have accomplished for us in Jesus. What incredible humility and servanthood Jesus has displayed before us, God. I pray that these things would not be lost on us, that they would drive us through conviction and drive us throughout this week to go forth and desire to tell others of the goodness and the good work that has been accomplished through Christ, our great God and Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is to save. To this I hold my shepherd will Forgiven, the future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and He was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus. Who has numbered? 
shared every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds sing it behold our god seated on his throne come let us adore church. 
Our next scripture reading comes from Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for his for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And this morning, we're also going to be praying for Twin Theodros. If you have read the book, Song of the Nightingale, you might know her by the name Esther. She was arrested in 2004 in Eritrea and has since received many brutal treatments by the prison guards there. But her friends say that she has withhold, withheld her, excuse me, that she has upheld her faith with honor and that she is even willing to stay so long as she is able to help anyone who is still in that prison with her. And so, let us pray for her and for her church. Father, we're thankful in ways that we probably couldn't have imagined a few months ago for the opportunity to meet together here today and to worship you together as a church. And we're thankful, Lord, for all of the good things that you have offered to us, especially things like new life. And we're thankful, Lord, for the Clodiers, Daniel and Kristen, their new baby, Karis. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless them in raising her, and that you would bless her as she grows and is taught in the fear and admonition of you. And Lord, at the same time, we are aware of the many hurting in our congregation, such as our elder Sal and his family, Darlene especially, who have contracted COVID. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to heal them and work in them so that they would recover fully. And Lord, we pray for Twen, who has suffered so much for you and has done it willingly and gladly. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen her as she has chosen to stay there despite many opportunities to leave or escape in order that she might serve the people there in prison with her fellow Christians and yet-to-be Christians. I pray that you continue to use her and strengthen her as she continues to seek to serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come now to our time of offering, so I would ask our ushers to make their way forward as they do. Let me just remind you that you are free to give through the Tithely, oh, sorry, you're free to give through the Tithely app, <laughs> you can hear me, um, through the Tithely app, you can give online, you can send in old school checks, uh, as I have one here. Um, or you can give here in person, and if you give here in person, there won't be any need for you to touch anything. The ushers will come by, um, and they will just extend this forward for you. So it should be safe for you to give, and you should do that, obviously, gladheartedly before the Lord. Uh, let me pray. They will uh, then start taking the offering, and then I want us to pray together for um, our visiting family, the Wilsons, this morning. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace, and thank you so much for the worship that is ours through Christ Jesus, and there is much to worship, more not just than we can think about, contemplate, meditate on, and um, worship with today for this time, but for all of eternity, there is glory yet to unpack through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that our hearts would be lifted up and you would use our talent, our time, and even our money to lift up and encourage the hearts of others for Christ's sake. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask the Wilsons, um, would you just come forward and we can safely distance. You can just be right here. But I want everyone to see you and know who you are. 
Um, we want to pray for this dear family. They are operating a couple of businesses, actually, in a different part of the world that right now is closed off because of COVID restrictions. They can't get into their country, and they are like they f they're feeling like a family without a country or without a home. But so we want them to know they're home here. And of course, we're all part of the family of God, and we're seeking a city with foundations whose borders will never be closed by any disease or anything else. So we want to pray and encourage them as they work through this time this fall, work on visas, work on permissions, work on um, just logistical issues that have to work out for them to be able to get back in country as soon as possible. So would you join me, uh, and let me just say, um, this is such a special family for me. I love them, and I would say they're like my own children, but I know they're adults, but um, I, I met Daniel and Carrie a long time ago when they were students at CBU, and they weren't even dating yet, and we met them, and through God's providence, I was at the time a pastor in Kentucky. They graduated CBU, moved to Kentucky, became members of our church, and worked so faithfully. We worked alongside each other for seven years there. Um, and just became family. So I love them dearly, and I'm so glad they're here today, and you get an opportunity to get to know them, but um, do pray for them. It's a hard work, and it's a difficult work for them. And so let's, pr let's pray together. Our great God, you are so gracious. You are gracious, compassionate, slow, to anger, abounding in steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love you. And we know that you will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, but to us, whose punishment has been borne through Jesus Christ, you love us to a thousand generations. You are faithful. We have every reason to expect that you will continue to be faithful to Daniel, to carry to their precious family. And we pray for that in accordance with your word, that you would just grant them your peace, grant them, Father God, your, um, your sight as they walk by faith and not by sight. Give them your guidance. Give them the Holy Spirit. Keep them close to you. Protect them. Guide their steps and guard their ways. Let them walk by faith and continue to see the great rewards that you have in store for them. I thank you for every blessing that I've already heard from them, and there have been many, and I trust that we will hear that many more. I pray also that you would raise our church up, give our church a heart to love them and serve them and help them in their way, um, but also to be helped by them as they continue to do good work in your name. Let us see that reward. Thank you again for them. Thank you that we get to be one with them through Christ Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray for them. Amen.
Today's sermon scripture reading is Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Is that you, Jonah? I'm sorry to call you out publicly like this. That's so awesome to see you. Oh, man. Hey, everybody, Jonah's here. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, definitely, let's catch up. All right. I'm sorry to do that. I'm just so happy to see Jonah. I can't help it. Um, I, uh, a few years ago, I was privileged to go on a trip to China. And on that trip, one of the things I did was... Um, I got to meet, uh, the, the goal of it was to talk to persecuted Christians. But anyway, one of the things that happened, I was with some uh, local people, and so they knew all the right places to go, right? And so I had the most amazing food that you could possibly imagine. It was fantastic. But I returned home just completely wiped out. I mean, I get jet lag badly anyway. Um, but this was a particularly bad case of jet lag, and I just couldn't, like, rise up for very long at a time. I would just fall back down, very sleepy, very headachy, very, um, you know, body achy. But I had taken 14 flights in 13 days across different countries, and it was like, man, I'm just physically not able to do this. But then some other things started happening, you know, other bodily things which are not needed to be discussed, but I knew, okay, that's not right. Something's not right there. Well, uh, to make a long story short, I ended up in the hospital and um, figured out eventually that I had salmonella poisoning. So, yeah, it was not fun. It was a pretty rough week, but obviously, thank God, I recovered. I'm better now, but it's fascinating to think how just one, I mean, it, it couldn't have been much, right? But just one little tiny impurity 
got into my system through food that I ate and wrecked my, my, my life for a week. One impurity from one infected meal caused much suffering. Well, you probably could think about your own life and some, some of your similar situations that you've been in and some things that you've experienced where you also had the same sort of thing. Maybe it was Montezuma's revenge. Maybe you crossed the border and went down to a different culture where you picked up in the water or possibly even in the ice that they were using some kind of parasite or bacteria, uh, something that ended up wrecking your system. It's a clear indication, of course, that we need purity. <laughs> that purification is a real issue in our world, and we definitely need pure water, and we need things to be purified. I don't know that it matters how your water is purified, if it's from a filter, if it's you know from uh, centrifugation, whatever that is, or from reverse osmosis or charcoal uh, carbon activation, like a Brita filter. It doesn't matter. You just got to have pure water, right? You need purity. Things in life, some things especially, need purification. It's not just water, of course. There's all sorts of illustrations in the scriptures and other places about the process of purifying gold. Gold is something we hold in high esteem. We value it greatly. It shines and glitters if it's purified, but it has to go through the process before it can be shiny, glittery, and have its full value. Well, copper is like that, silver is like that, crude oil is like that. Um, I'm sure you know that, but you take crude oil out of the ground and there's a really super complex process to turn it into gasoline and like you make one of the byproducts is like this coal kind of stuff called petroleum coke. But it goes through all that goes through a process before you can get gasoline. So from gold to crude oil to water, all sorts of things in our world need to be purified. We need purification. We live in a world that has a need for purification. And of course, you know where this is going. <laughs> The worst contaminant in the universe is what the Bible calls sin, and it needs purification. We need purification from sin. Sin is, in fact, the most awful contaminant. Why do I say that? Because sin, if we look back to Genesis and just walk back through uh, the fall, as we call it, in, that, in the first three chapters of Genesis... We find out that sin contaminates everything. It contaminates the environment, all right? So if you wonder why there's often crises concerning the environment and concerning our relationship to our environment, well, sin is playing a role there. It's just the nature of things. It's why if you come to my house, I can show you where I'm battling to keep grass from growing in my concrete patio and struggling to make it grow in the yard where I've planted it and watered it routinely. It's the fall. It's got to be the fall. There's got to be a remedy. Sin causes problems between us and our environment, right? Um, and you can work and work and work, but as the scriptures remind us, cursed is the ground because of you, in toil, you sh and because of you, because of your sin, because of sinful humanity, Adam and Eve, all sorts of relationships were broken, including our relationship with the environment. So because of you, in toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. Well, we could look back at Genesis 3 and find out it affects the cattle, it affects, it, it, it affects the beast, it affects childbirth, it affects all sorts of things related to just how we live in the world, our environment. But it's, of course it's not just the environment, it's relationships too. Sin contaminates relationships. Relationships are under the curse of sin. The relationship between man and his wife, you remember. 
relationships even between us and animals. Like just when you think you've got them tamed, they strike back. There was a story years ago now, but Siegfried and Roy, you know, were famous for having this pet tiger until it wasn't a pet anymore. Steve Irwin knew all about animals, and yet he died from one very unexpectedly. Or on the flip side, we could have stories like Michael Vick who abused animals. These are all improper relationships between us and the earth, and it flows between us and other people. That's why marital counseling is a very, very common occurrence. Divorce, much too common occurrence. There are problems between relationships, but it's not just relationships between people, it's relationships within us too. Back in the Genesis narrative, Adam, where are you, God says. But he was naked and ashamed and so hid from God. That's a breakdown in his own relationship to himself because of sin. So ultimately, we've got all of these broken, lost relationships because of sin, and ultimately they're because of the broken relationship that we have with God. Sin has affected everything. It contaminates the world that we inhabit. And we know from the scriptures, too, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Everything ends up being affected by this whole dynamic. Isaiah was a great prophet of God, a holy man, very much revered in the literature, right, and in, and in tradition, but when he was brought into the throne room of God in his vision, the first thing he noticed is, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Even the holiest among us are affected by sin. Sin in us, sin in those around us, sin in our environment, sin in all of our relationships. And if we take the Bible seriously, we'll figure out that the root issue is that sin is in each one of our hearts. We are born under the curse so that our natures are sinful natures. By nature, we are sinful. Jesus said, out of the heart come the evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanderers, and the list could have gone on and on and on. It's from in the heart and mind that sin gets out. So how in the world, if that's our nature by birth, and if that's the reality of the world we inhabit, how do we escape this dynamic? How in the world can we undo the consequences of sin if it's so pervasive? If that contaminant contaminates everything, where shall the purity come from? How in the world are we going to produce anything good? James asked that question, right? Can both fresh water and salt water come forth from the same spring? But my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You can't produce purity. The whole situation seems quite hopeless until we read Hebrews, <laughs> especially Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, which we might as well spend the rest of our lives studying because it's so awesome. Verse 3, last part, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's glory right there. Jesus made purification for our sins. Say it a different way. 
Jesus Christ purifies sinners. Purification is provided. The text says, after he made purification of sins. I want to look at this for the next few minutes, what God's word is saying to us. And you know that I'm going to be borrowing a little bit from the rest of the book as we've, as we've been doing through these first four verses. They're, they're just hitting the themes that trace through the book. And these are magnificent, life-changing themes. And today is the theme of Jesus' purification, his work that purifies. Christ completed purification. Now, listen to what that means. And I want to I help us to really digest what that means, that Christ completed purification. And I want to start by saying what that does not mean. Okay, it's always helpful if you're defining something to know what you're not saying. So, what are we not saying here? What is the text not saying? All right, Christ completed purification. That does not mean that Christ is making us pure or making purification. In other words, it's a definitive statement that it's finished. It's not an open-ended kind of purification that's in view here. It's a certain purification. If, in fact, Christ is making purification for our sins, then there wouldn't be any he sat down. But after the purification, he sat down. Does that make sense? I probably am not explaining it well, but Piper always does. So let me give it to you from John Piper, okay? Piper says, don't think I send a long time in my life and then I found Christ and I believed and he interposed his blood and he cleaned up that part of my life now I'm living a little bit by faith still sinning don't think that way the interposing of the blood was 2,000 years ago never to be repeated finished for all your sins for the sin that you will commit on your dying day a year from now or 40 or 50 or 60 years from now the purification that happened 2,000 years ago, this is awesome. And yes, it is open to great abuses. Paul had to deal with those abuses, and so he would, people would say, oh, let sin abound, that, that grace may abound all the more. May it never be, Paul says, right? But Paul was willing to risk it. So was the writer to Hebrews Jesus made purification for sin. It is finished. It's a decisive thing that happened to all your sins at Calvary. It doesn't get repeated, which is why the author says, once for all. Once for all. He's also not saying that Jesus will make purification for sins, as if Jesus were waiting on you, as if Jesus were testing you maybe to see if you're going to screw this thing up, right? Pray God he doesn't ever put us under that kind of test. It's not a wait and see, or it's not, hey, do they really mean it this time? It's not, is that decision a sincere one? This is a work that Jesus does. Jesus purifies sinners. By this, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10.10 10. Your purification, then, is not waiting on any circumstances. It's not waiting on any people. It's not waiting on other people to do the right thing. It's not waiting for the time to be right in your mind to make a full commitment. This is Jesus working. After Jesus made purification, he sat down and he's still sitting down. We do have on record in Acts chapter 7 where he stood up once, at least, to receive Stephen who was martyred for his faith. And he will stand up and get on a horse. We'll go to Revelation some other day. 
But Christ made purification of sins and sat down. What does this mean for you? What do we, what do we hear him saying to our need this morning? Well, I want to just give you these three quick realities, what this means for you, okay? First, it means you have an inward purity. Second, it means you have an outward purity. And third, it means you have an ethical purity. All right, inward, outward, and ethical purity. The inward purity, number one, is the essence of purity. Essentially, you can be pure. So it, it's just the difference between a plate of food that has salmonella on it versus a plate of food that doesn't. Which would you rather be? Let me just urge you to do the non-salmonella plate. I promise you'll be much happier. It's, an, it's a purity versus impurity. Now, this is remarkable. Hebrews 10, 22 says that true believers, those who are in Christ, have their hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Now, I don't know if you can even imagine this. I was um, working, a friend um, actually had a business and, you know, I was needing work, so he let me be part, he just let me work for him, which was awesome, very generous. But as I was working for him, there would be times when I would spend long, time, long hours driving somewhere with him. And so we would have great conversations, of course, and we would talk about the gospel a good bit, which we shared. But I noticed one day that we got on a conversation about um, just how he couldn't sleep and, you know, what, what sleep for. And he just had very irregular sleep patterns. So we got on this conversation, and it came around to the idea of the peace of Christ ruling your heart. So, like, you know that one of the great things God does is commands us to rest like that's an what well, only sinners would have to be commanded to rest, right? But he has to command us to rest because when we rest, it's a sure sign that we're confessing he is in control and we're not. Same kind of thing when you pray. Like you're not doing anything when you pray. <laughs> so you're probably doing more than anything else you do in life. Because if that, in those moments, you're saying, I trust the living God to do his work. So I was talking to this friend, and we started talking about just our consciences being clear. And it got very awkward. Because it became pretty obvious that his conscience wasn't clear. And so that led to a fruitful conversation about the necessity of believers understanding it doesn't mean that you never sinned quite the opposite it means that you recognize your sins for what they are you you without any fear call those sins what they are without any hesitation say yes i'm guilty and also without any doubt saying jesus took those sins and he has purified me from them I confess them he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness it's that level it's going down one step further not just thinking that you're forgiven but understanding that what God forgives he purifies from, from through this priestly work of Jesus Christ We have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. This deals with the problem at its root. The sin problem is rooted deep within us. And what has to happen is we actually have to be, I don't know, give me a phrase, born again. The first time you're born, you don't have anything to do with it. You just are born. You're born with the DNA that you have. You're born with the coding that you get. You're born into the family that you're born into. 
you don't have a thing to do with any of it, really. But you do live according to that nature, according to all those circumstances. The same sort of thing happens when you're born again. You have God's spiritual DNA, children of God DNA in you. And you're in a new family. And you're growing into, from the root of, that new reality. It's rooted in Jesus' purifying work. Way back in the days of the prophets, the prophet Ezekiel talked about a time and talked about a work of God when he would take your hearts and sprinkle them, <clears throat> take a heart of stone, take it out, wash it with fresh water, sprinkle it clean, and give you a new heart. It's it's fascinating because this is obviously exactly what they do now in open heart surgery, right? They take a skill saw and cut your chest open and crack it back and reach in there and pull your heart out of your chest and just cut it loose of everything that holds it, put it in a nice chest, water on it, fix it. Doctor holds it in his hand, pulls out one valve, sticks in another valve, puts it all back in, cranks it back up, and voila! You have a new heart that works. It's really actually miraculous that that can be done. But that's just a physical sample picture of what God really does in Jesus Christ. When he makes purification for your sins, the old heart that whose first nature was towards evil thoughts and adulteries now that nature is toward, I want to learn more from God. I want to listen to what he says. I want to obey what he says. Because I know, he knows like what's life, what life is all about. And he's good. And he's telling me how to flourish on this earth and how to live an invincible life forever. It's a new heart. Which is why... After he goes through, this writer in Hebrews, after he goes through some details on this, says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. We are those invincible people who have pure hearts. So this is actually making our hearts pure so that we can boldly approach the throne of grace, having been sprinkled with the purifying blood of the Lamb of God. Wow. Wow. We fall at Jesus' feet and just break our lives open to let out the sweet perfume of praise like Mary did so long ago. There is an inward purity now that defines us. And that also exemplifies to the world an outward purity. Number two, an outward purity. You know from reading the New Testament, the Gospels, other places, there are all sorts of religious rites. There were in the first century, and quite frankly there are today too, all sorts of religious rites where people show outwardly that they're holy, right? There were water pots in John chapter 2 for purification. Jesus turned them into really good wine. There are like Jesus... Questions about um, the temple, questions about he was taken for purification rites at his birth. The Pharisees, who were like really troubled that Jesus' disciples weren't washing their hands properly. There were all these things about outward purity. Well, we have an outward purity now, and the writer of Hebrews is going to make this point. In chapter 9, we have an outward purity, but it comes from this purifying work of Jesus. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, 
you yourself become a vessel, a purified vessel to honor God. To put it in Paul's languages, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. But you are, you, it, it's as though you're like, you're like one of the cherubim in the temple, or you're like one of the gold pans, or the scepters, or the, <laughs> the incense things in, in, in the temple. You now have become a set-apart instrument to demonstrate God's purifying work. Let me say it this way. The purification work of Jesus Christ becomes the ground of our sanctification. All right? Think about the temple and those vessels in the temple. There were these gold pans that you would put the coals in in the temple. Just, it's just a regular pan that somebody made with a regular handle that somebody made. What makes it special? Because by God's design and God's decree, this particular pan was set apart to be used only in the temple where the presence of God is. So the setting apartness of it is the thing that establishes it as sanctified for God. When Jesus makes purification for our sins, we then move into this category where we're set apart for God's use. What is it that sets us apart? Well, it's not our religious denomination per se, it's not our political affiliation per se. It's not our skin color. It's not, you know, our, um, what, what else? I mean, can we just go a really long list of the ways that, like our economics, our intelligence? No. What is it? God, through Jesus Christ, making purification for our sins. That's the thing that sets us apart. That establishes our outward purity, which then sets us up for part three, our ethical purity, which is really just what we call our sanctification. We now walk in a new way. We now serve in a different way. We now have different priorities. We are now able to love other people. We are now less selfish and less self-oriented and more oriented on God and others because we have a new nature and because sin no longer defines us. That's not our new nature. Sin is not our new nature. That's our old nature. We've been purified. So as naturally as like the glittering part comes off of the gold, so God-glorifying actions come forth from our life because we've been born again. After he made purification for, of sins, he set us in a new place to walk in a new way. So, Paul would write to Timothy, flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's what they're doing. To the pure, he says to Titus, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. By their deeds they deny him. Denying God isn't just a matter of apostatizing with your lips. It's saying I've been made pure and living an impure life. That negates the whole testimony. Do you see that? But on the flip side... Like really being made pure by the work of Christ sets off this new chain of events, this new life focus, this new direction. And you long for it. You want to be holy because you know your God is holy. You want to love other people because you know your God loves other people. You want to love God because God loves God. 
and you love what he loves. Well, let me just say, in closing, Christ has made purification for sins, and after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of, mag of the majesty on high. Do you see the glory in that? In that little phrase, how glorious is our gospel. This comes not just with the glory of Christ who died to root out and give us a whole new nature, but the glory of security on which we can actually rest. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. After he made purification of sins, so, all right, you're not actually defined by your sin anymore. Yeah, you've sinned. And yeah, some of us have sinned in terrible ways. Some of us didn't actually commit those sins, but our hearts were 100% wanting to. We really desired it with all of our hearts. We just lacked opportunity to carry it out. And if we told someone, we would be pretty sure they would never want to talk to us again. That level of sin been purified. It doesn't define you. But even more glorious, after he made purification for sin, he sat down. What does it mean that Christ sat down at the right hand of God in the throne room of heaven? It means there is 100% security for your purification of sins. Now that's really good news because your mind will lie to you and it will tell you that you're going to fall away from Christ, that you're going to go back to your sin. For you to go for you to get unpurified from sin, someone's going to have to storm heaven and dethrone Christ where he is sitting down. He's not like, he doesn't have a sword in his hand. He's not hiding behind a rock for protection. He is sitting because no one's going to storm heaven and dethrone Jesus. You have to believe that. Even if the devil himself accuses you. And starts just rattling off all of the ways that you have fallen short of the living God. And all the ways that you ought to be condemned. Say to him two things. First, Satan, you have not named the half of it. And second, Jesus Christ made purification for sins. And after he made purification for sins, he sat down where he still sits and in the throne room of God. And if I can read the rest of the book of Hebrews to you, I can tell you he lives to make intercession for me. Undo that. Nothing threatens you. No one threatens you. Death doesn't threaten you if Jesus has made purification of your sins. You're safe. Your soul is secure. And we become the most blessed people on the planet. We in Christ are most blessed of all people, which is probably why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Father, let our hearts know that we are in Christ, that Christ is seated at your right hand, that his enemies are being made a footstool for his feet, and that we are purified from our sins. Oh God, what a gospel you give us. What love you have shown us in Christ. I pray that you would strengthen us 
your people to rest in these glorious realities that you unfold for us. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love you've shown us. Thank you for making purification for sins. And lead us now to love it, to love the reality of our calling in Christ and to love each other for his sake and to love the world that they too might know Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. benediction comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. May the Lord bless your week.